So I'll start by acknowledging many, many people and organisations without whom I wouldn't be here. Numerous funders, um, particularly federal government and GRDC, although not data included in this talk, but I've been heavily supported by the CRDC as well. Um, current collaborators on the current National Soil Carbon Monitoring Project, which will be the last part of my talk that I want to go over, um, from Saudi Persa, South Australia, um, Tasmanian um, Department of Natural Resources, Murdoch University, AGVIC, University of New England and Queensland Government. And most importantly, the absolute... Yeah. There we are, pointy thing. Absolute gamut of people who helped me. Um, you'll all recognise this fella, Jeff. Um, you'll probably recognise some of his slides too. Um, Lynn MacDonald and Sanani Kiranaratna, both also at the Work Campus. James Hunt, who I've had a lot of useful conversations with on nitrogen. And then massive team of technical staff, um, Athena, Tom, Janine, Steve, um, Christina, who is an experimental scientist with us, Sheridan, Paul, and lastly, Liz Stower, who manages the soil carbon project for us and keeps us on the straight and narrow. So our outline of today's talk, give me a discussion in three different areas. A um, bit of a sort of university lecture style on what it is and what it does where it comes from and where it goes, which might start answering some of the questions posed by Colin. Some, not all, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, and then an overview of that carbon project. That was something I was specifically asked by Michael to start giving an introduction on, because that's an ongoing follow-up to SCARP that a few of you may, have, may remember from a decade ago. So what it is and what it does. What it is, well, so organic matter, not so organic carbon, usually estimated simply by weighing it, burning it, and weighing it again. It's a little bit agricultural. Um, and it contains all, so carbon's only about 65, 67, I forget, 72. I forget the exact number, the conversion between the two. But it's not all of organic matter. You've got all this oxygen, which doesn't really do much more than form part of the molecules. That's not particularly agriculture relevant, bit of hydrogen because it doesn't weigh much, but there's a lot of molecules, even though it doesn't weigh much. Then you have these others up here, particularly nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, and other micronutrients. Without these, you don't have that. So bear in mind when we're talking about mineralizing nitrogen, you're also mineralizing that. When you talk about building organic matter, you need these to do so. Um, so yes, solid organic carbon is just the carbon. Be careful when you're interpreting data that you recognize which of these two, either solid organic carbon or solid organic matter, you're talking about. We usually measure that by direct measurement um, using something called a LECO, a high combustion, um, high combustion instrument that turns it to CO2 and measure the amount of CO2. So that is a measure of just the carbon. There's also carbonate, inorganic carbon. We tend to discount these in these, this conversation. That's emerging as not perhaps being the wisest of things to be doing, but nonetheless, they are cycled very differently. They just happen to contain the same element, carbon. Um, so organic matters structure. There's an old view that was defined by its presumptive chemistry. We couldn't really look at it, so we presumed didn't have the tools to look at it, so we presume things about it from how it behaved. It made these things, humic acids and fulvic acids. Remember those? Dissolve it in, dissolve it in, um, in a hydroxide and then precipitate it with an acid. What falls out is humic acid, what didn't was fulvic acid. It's quite an artifact, really. It's not really how it is at all. If you're really lucky, you might find some human. Really recalcitrant stuff. Also, mostly fictitious. So, organic matter. So, these things basically made us think that stable organic matter was actually stable. It's not. It's stabilized. It's stabilized by its environmental and bio, by its situation in the environment, in the soil environment, the biological and chemical reactions, and its association with soil mineral materials, 
protected from decomposition, either by being bound chemically to clay particles or by being locked up physically within aggregates, microaggregates and microaggregates that basically prevent it from being decomposed because no microbe can get there, or if it can, there's not the oxygen or water that it requires to carry out that work. So actually, that's quite an important distinction between being stable and stabilised. If it's stable, it shouldn't matter what we do to it, it should still be there. We know we lose it. And we lose it because it is only stabilised. If you take... Um, if you take a whole load of this organic matter away from the solid matrix and stick it in a petri dish, it'll disappear pretty quickly. Microbes are very capable of eating it when it's available to them. We also presume that it's primarily microbially derived. I should have changed this slide because in the last six months this is being challenged again, that actually a fair chunk of these waxy compounds and sugars can actually be bound, come directly from the plant and be bound in that form in the soil. So it doesn't necessarily require a microbe to achieve this. Um, and a lot of the work that precedes me at CSIRO, and I've contributed to, but it really is Jeff's, is this work on real, trying to understand a new paradigm of ecologically relevant pools that aren't defined just because we can dissolve it in a caustic substance and then precipitate it. So we have plant residues on the surface and buried plant residues. They're not technically soil because as soil scientists like to call soil as something less than two millimeters for reasons that I still can't quite get my head around, but there we are. Within soil organic carbon pool, we've then defined this particulate organic carbon pool as being less than two mils, but greater than 50 microns. 50 microns being roughly the size of silt, if you're thinking about particle size analysis. And then what Jeff termed humus-like organic carbon, what the Americans would call mineral-associated organic carbon. I'm not entirely certain either is 100% correct, so I'll stick with the Australian adopted version for now. Um, and that's basically what is associated with those fine particles and thus stabilized. Lastly, sorry, and, and down these so far, you've got a fairly predictable change in chemistry. Um, carbohydrates decrease, carbon to nutrient ratio decreases. So think of wheat stubble as maybe C to N ratio of 100 to 1, going down to the humus like organic carbon, which is normally about 6 or 7 to 1. So you need a lot more nitrogen to have this stuff for the amount of carbon that's in it relative to up here. And resistance to decomposition does increase to an extent, but that's, like I say, that's primarily governed because of where it is. If you have very, very small pieces of, sub 50 micron pieces of this stuff, they'll decompose very quickly. Um, and then we have this last bit, this resistant organic carbon pool, which is dominated, but not entirely made out of charcoal white material. The reason I'm bringing this up is I've already mentioned that we don't talk about inorganic carbon too much because of how it behaves so differently. It's presumed inert, it isn't really, but it's not really something that enters this conversation much. The resistant organic carbon or charcoal white material, again, is not directly formed by these stabilization processes. That's coming from bushfires, past bushfires, soot blowing in, um, burning stubble, etc. And it's a very different beast. It's not, it is highly stable rather than being stabilized. Highly aromatic. Biochar would fit in that category. And they look different. Um, they look different than an electron microscope. Particulate stuff still looks a bit like plant residues. The humus, organic carbon, all this waxy gloopy stuff and then the crystalline structure of the charcoal-like material and the resistant organic carbon. So they look differently when you poke down a microscope. Jeff has a one with higher magnification than Lynn, that's why I can see these things. Anything running around in those would be a problem because they're in a vacuum. Um, but we also use something called NMR, which of course anybody who's heard Jeff talk about will have mentioned. And that tells us directly about the chemistry of them. These two might look quite similar. The important difference is 
This large peak in what's called the Oelkill area, so that's the carbohydrate, sugars, cellulose type area, and this lower peak here in the alkyl area, which is the lipidy, the lipidy sticky fraction. Humus like carbon, they're much more equal and even dominated in some cases. The resistant organic carbon, that peak is in a different place. Note it's to the left of the 100 rather than to the right. Um, that's the aromatic material that dominates the resistant type fraction. So visually, they look differently. Chemically, they're very different. And we can separate them. And they, these things sit underneath various carbon models, including FULCAM, which is what's used by the federal government to estimate carbon, soil carbon budgets. This is an evolving space. This isn't where the story ends, and we are doing more work in this space. They don't always line up perfectly with what we see, but they're a hell of a lot better than humic and fulvic acids. Um, and as I said, we can see quite big differences. So this next couple of slides are, are some of the analyses of these things that we've separated physically and now put through a different instrument. So you've got the C2N ratio here. So this huge range in the, if I can find the pointy thing, huge range carbon to nitrogen ratio in the coarse material, but a very tight range in the fine material. That alkyl to alkyl ratio I was talking about, um, so that's the measure of decompose, decomposedness of this material, higher in the fine than the coarse. But the kicker, and this is why we need to use that NMR material to fish it out, because we can sieve, because charcoal is both fine and coarse. So sieving it doesn't work. Other people use density fractionation approaches, so you try and make it float off the light stuff and the heavy stuff at the source of the clay sinks. Well, unfortunately, charcoal also floats and sinks. So we can't physically get this stuff out. You can get big pieces out, but you can't get the fine stuff out. And both that fine and the coarse fraction have a sizable amount of charcoal in them, depending on where they are. This is data from SCARP. What that looks like in the NMR, just to really emphasize this further, this is aggregated data from SCARP, from about 300 spectra in here altogether. Coarse on the left and fine on the right, depths down the profile, so 0 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30. And you see at the 0 to 10 um, centimeter, that alkyl to alkyl ratio is really stark in the coarse material, but remains relatively stable down the profile. So you, there is a trend on both sides, and we're looking at more and more processed material, the DP going to the soil surface, as you'd expect. But this fine material is always quite different to the coarse material, chemically. And sorry, let's get past that. And whereas the charcoal-like peak there is highly variable at all the points. So it is a bit of a wild card, and that's one of the reasons why we struggle measuring how carbon's behaving. So you've got this stuff in there that is still carbon, but it's not behaving the same way as all the stuff produced by plants and processed by microbes. So what it does, um, I'm going to go through a couple of American studies now because they're really neat and they're mechanistic and probably quite useful because they're mechanistic rather than for how exactly they'd work out there. This first one is a study in a pot experiment done in the glass house uh, by Emily Oldfield and colleagues. She took topsoil from a carbon rich soil and a subsoil, so mineralogically the same, and diluted the topsoil with the subsoil. So she got a range, effectively, the same soil with a range of organic carbon within it. Imposed a couple of treatments across it, um, plus or minus nitrogen, optimum irrigation or deficit irrigation. And above ground, ground biomass, whilst it was best in the best treatment of nitrogen and irrigation, not surprising, all four of them followed the same arc through of around 5% organic matter, so that's around 3% organic carbon. In this particular soil, in that circumstance, it is only the organic matter that was, cha that was changed under each of those colours of lines. Obviously, there's different treatments between the colours of lines, but within each line, it's the same change. So she, it's a direct relationship between the amount of organic matter that was there and plant productivity. It's not that many studies out there that have actually been able to prove that. We all know it is. We like it. It's brown and fluffy, and we think we should have more organic matter. But if I was a fertiliser salesman, I could tell you, you apply 40 units of N and you'll get that. Apply 60, you'll get that plus or minus a bit of rainfall. Getting data like this about organic matter is quite a rare thing because it's always confounded by everything else. Um, 
Moving to the other end of the spectrum, still in America, and Emily Oldfield is still part of this. Um, this was a study looking at their equivalent of our ABES data and their soil survey data. They looked across 12,376 county years worth of dryland cropping data. It's a wide period of time and across a wide part of the country, but multiple years. Um, and what they found was an average marginal increase, that's increase in yield per unit of per percent of organic matter, of 0.83. And that was in normal and moderate years. It wasn't that good, it's 0.73 and 0.76. In the severe and very severe drought years, quite the opposite, those who managed to get a crop off and were in the higher organic matter were doing much, much better. So here, and that comes back to what we've been talking about, probably about water use efficiency as much as anything else in this situation. But they were able to do that, in fact. And it wasn't just water use efficiency. There was a direct effect attributed to soil organic matter concentration itself, and a large effect about how organic matter is governing nutrient availability. So those are two studies out of the US that are actually starting to really put useful numbers on agronomically what this stuff is doing for us that get us towards the same level of prescriptive understanding as we're already able to do when we talk about adding nutrients. So that's a snapshot of what it is and what it does. Equally important is where does it come from and where does it go? Elephant in the room first, um, why don't we just bring it in from somewhere else? That's easy, that's an easy way to build carbon. Compost manures, biosolids, biochars, they all behave differently. You know, almost every compost manure, biosolid and biochar will behave differently, never mind between the classifications. It's just not necessarily a reason not to do it. That different, you can get a cow, it's great. When it comes to accounting for carbon, you have to remember this. If that's your game and you're wanting to consider a, calming, a, a carbon farming um, project, only the carbon you build above and beyond what you've brought in counts. Because the fellow who made the biochar gets credits for that, not you applying them. Contaminants. All of a bit of PFAS and microplastics. Um, yeah, there are reputable suppliers who will do their damnedest to make sure that this is a minimal issue for you. There are plenty of places you can probably get your hands on it where it's less reputable. But there are emerging contaminants such as microplastics and PFAS that are really proving to be quite difficult both to monitor and manage. Um, it's a really unfortunate thing when we think about trying to be more sustainable and cir circular in our use. There is a finite amount of phosphorus on the planet full stop and eventually we'll have dug it all up and if we're not recycling these things we'll have a problem. But contaminants are right now an emerging issue and certainly other states in the country I've got a pretty hard line on the application of some of these things because of that issue. The one for me, and bearing in mind I work at CSIRO and we try to consider these aspects at the national level and national importance, is scale. Using ABEAR's figures, a couple of years ago, it was just shy of 350,000 tonnes of biosolid dry matter produced in the country. Same year, about 32 million hectares under cropping. So you'd all got about 11 kilos per hectare each. It's not really going to solve any carbon or, for that matter, nutrient problem at the national level. And that's why I don't, despite having a PhD in the use of compost, that is what my PhD is in, rather than agronomy, that's why I don't pay too much attention to it in this game. It's interesting locally, and I have worked in these spaces, but it's clearly not a national answer. It can't be if that number's so small, and that's before you get to the problems of moving it around the country, because it's usually not where most of the broad acre cropping is. Um, so we can't bring it in, what do we do? Well, Colin said this, we need to grow more things. Net primary productivity, so that's the balance from photosynthesis, plant fixes CO2, it also emits CO2 through its respiration, what's left over once it's finished doing that is net primary productivity. And that's ultimately how big the pipe in is. There's a paper by Henry Janssen um, last year that basically said that this is an upper limit that you and what we are at now we can't improve on. I disagree with that and we did argue about that. Um, NPP can be modified by how you manage things. It can be modified by how you manage what you're growing right now. It can be modified if you change your practice and, and look at 
drawing things more of the time if you can. It can be modified for you if it stops raining. Um, so it can go up and down, but nonetheless, we're all in agreement that it doesn't matter what else you do, if you've not got much coming in, you're unlikely to be able to keep much of it. So ways to do something about this. Better growth, I'll start with something more locally relevant for the Mali. Um, perhaps a little um, drastic at times. Um, Lynn McDonald's and Therese McBeath's sub subsoil constraints project, where they looked at deep ripping, slotting, putting down organic matter down a deep rip, things like that. It didn't work everywhere. It really didn't work in some places. But in others, we've got a consistent rise of one ton per hectare per year increasing yields because of those treatments. So if you have a fundamental physical constraint in your soil production, anything else I tell you to do in this talk won't matter because that constraint is stopping you getting any further. So the first thing you need to do is understand your, bio, your physical and chemical constraints to production and address them. Otherwise, playing around with nutrition is not going to help. Disease pest management, improved agronomy, um, improved varieties. Take a look at the high yielding crops initiative run by GRDC. Um, yeah, they're able to get some fantastic yield numbers in there. How are they doing that? Um, very, very tight agronomy. Very, very careful selection of varieties. Very, very well timed fertilizer applications, but not ridiculous fertilizer applications. Probably deficit in most cases. Um, requires an awful lot of effort. Is it realistic across the whole country? Probably not, but I think almost everybody would say they could probably do something better when they're managing their farm. Um, and improved varieties I have up here. It was an interesting point that Colin raised about how we have improved our varieties over time, or perhaps not, depending on what you want them to do. Um, the little snippet I've put up here from Greg Rebetsky, that's looking at the long, that's long coleoptile research. So that's directly addressing being able to sow seeds deeper into moisture so you get more effective establishment and early vigor as a result. Traits like that probably are quite useful in a drying climate. So you can, yeah. I'll take a step sideways to the R word, regenerative practice. Where after all, it's a soil health, soil biology forum. Minimum disturbance, maintain cover, diverse rotations, include livestock, minimise chemistry. They're all things that most that's best practice Australian cropping anyway. The one kicker here, and it does it is minimise. It's not eradicate. There aren't many people operating at commercial level in the regenerative space who want to completely remove all inputs. The thing to bear in mind, reduce fertilizer, reduce crop growth. Reduce crop growth, reduce carbon inputs. More carbon mineralization from your soil, more nitrogen mineralization from your soil good, more carbon mineralization happens at the same time. There are different ways of going about this. Greater. Um, Greater integra integration of legumes into your system. Greater integration of livestock and pasture phases into your system. Doesn't all have to come from a bag, but nonetheless. If you're taking stuff out, it has to come in from somewhere. As Colin said, it is not alchemy. An adequate N is typically required to build soil organic matter. This is a review from the US, but on international studies. The axis, the x-axis is the percentage increase or decrease of the fertilizer treatment relative to control across a whole load of long-term trials that they examined. You need to keep an eye on pH. So in low pH soils, you're not getting much luck. And in short duration studies, what's your average length of a research study? Three, four years? You're not getting much luck. But in the longer term experiments, particularly in neutral or higher soils, this meta-analysis shows that your fertilized treatment has more carbon than your unfertilized treatment. Not surprising given the fact that you're taking off nitrogen and thus losing carbon every year at harvest. So you've got to bring it back from somewhere. Um, and here's a case in point. This is data again from GRDC across four different regions in their then southern region at the time 
the study was carried out. Rob Norton's work basically shows across about 125 different paddocks. Every single one of them was taking more nitrogen out of the farm gate harvest as they were applying as fertilizer. And if you look at Abe's stats for grain yield, take an average of protein to get at the N, and then look at how much bagged N was applied, you'll get a similar number nationally as well. So it's a bit important to have a think about the right amount of nitrogen. This is a figure that was posited again by American colleagues, and sadly I have taken the cover crop stuff out of this talk, so I wanted to get the, um, car the um, carbon monitoring program into it. But some of the stuff we hear from overseas, from the northern wetter areas, may not work for pretty obvious reasons out there. But some of the thinking and theory behind some of it still holds, holds value. This figure here is a stylized idea of what happens if you're below the annual optimum nitrogen rate or above the annual optimum rate, nitrogen rate, whether or not you're getting a, the impact on these three different um, factors. Yield change and residue production. Well, that's, we know that. Yeah, this is why we fertilize for, fertilize for this point here. You're aiming for optimum economic yield, usually, which isn't necessarily optimum biomass production. It rarely is. Change in yield per unit of N obviously goes down. If you only apply one unit of N versus 10 units of N, you'll get a far greater change for your one unit of N than you will for your 10, than you will for your 50, than you will for your 100. And obviously, if you keep piling it on, eventually nitro is going to start skyrocketing too. But the point is, there's no real ecological reason for carbon to be burned off by adding too much nitrogen. It doesn't actually make that much sense at all, unless you go to great extremes. But we don't need to risk being over here if we can get it right. And this is where James Hunt's work on nitrogen banking comes in. There are risks to applying more nitrogen, we know them. Environmental, um, economic. But interestingly, there's another risk that tends to get forgotten about. It's the missed opportunity in a good year when you didn't have enough nitrogen in the first place. And what James's study on the nitrogen, on his nitrogen bank experiment has shown is that basically by having a, an optimum amount of N there, and the whole idea of the nitrogen bank is that you are measuring N at the start of the season, and you're making a calculation on the basis of that. It doesn't work if, you don't, if you're not prepared to take an N test every single season. Um, over the longer term, and this is now five years' worth of data, those where he's been applying more N have also, on average across those five years, been more profitable. That's mean gross margin across those five years. In a couple of years, it was probably down here, and in one year, it was all the way up there. But on average, in, at his site um, at Cuyo, so in the Vic Mali, you were, he was finding on average across those five years, even though there was a hit taken on one or two of them, the benefits in the years when it was good way outweighed the losses in the bad year. And that seems to be a message that's coming out of a few other experiments that have at least touched on this, some of John Kierkegaard's work in New South Wales as well. Now, another criticism about the end bank is, well, well, you can't do anything with legumes in it. Yes, you can. You just plant a legume in the rotation, take your end test. Next. And legumes, something else that gets brought up is that if you, you, know, you can grow two different sorts of legumes, grow pasture legumes, great, they'll put lots of nitrogen in. But if you grow a grain legume, aren't you going to take all your nitrogen away with you and lose that benefit? Um, this is really new data from Rowan Brill's work with GRDC. New South Wales space, this was presented at GRDC updates earlier in the year. I've just grabbed the data and drawn, the, drawn some prettier figures around it. Um, total biomass along the bottom, up to 15 tonnes per hectare, said it was good crop. Um, total N fixation, and this is the astonishing thing, just shy of 600 kilos of N. And this is done by isotopes, the numbers are, seem to be pretty, pretty real. 600 units. Who would be thinking about applying 600 units of biogeria? Not many. 
If I go back to my European days, that's three times the limit for a nit nitrate vulnerable zone in a European agricultural catchment. <laughs> um, the interesting one is the one on the right hand side. Grain yield along the bottom, so that's your six tonnes per hectare ones, the faba beans. Note your very valuable legumes aren't quite so good at the end fixing. Um, well, this is end balance after you've taken the yield away. A bit more of a shotgun than over here, not too surprising. And it does start aggregating out by crop type. Messages out of this, if you are growing big legumes, and they do, and they go well, you can still have substantial amounts of N left over the following year. And that 300 kilos <coughs> remaining, yeah, that's two or three years worth and beyond. You're not going to see all of that. Some of it will end up locked up in organic matter. Some of it will get lost. It's the importance of testing before you season to understand what's there. Just aside on that, a lot of this will be as organic nitrogen, not nitrate. So a standard deep end test where you're looking at just nitrate would underestimate how much is there. And again, if your main legume in your rotation is something like lentils, you've got a different value value ratio between what you're harvesting off versus what the ENIC might have fixed is doing for you. But nonetheless, clearly, bringing more legumes in the system has an option to shift the dial substantially on notion availability, if you get it right. Now at this point, I want to clear up a bit of this last bit of misunderstanding about notion fertilizer use. This is the source of a lot of it. Um, this um, probably strong misinterpretation of some long-term data out of the US. This is from the Morrow plots, I think they're in Illinois. Um, two treatments, control, no fertilizer applied, and fertilizer applied treatment. Now until the late 1960s, that fertilizer was applied as manure. In the 1960s, they changed to applying synthetic N instead, because of course that became the dominant form of N that was available and the most agronomically relevant, so they changed. And look what's happened. Carbon's gone back down. It must have been the fault of the synthetic again. No. They stopped applying manure. <laughs> they stopped bringing in three or four tons of extra organic matter every year. All that figure is telling you is that the amount of extra carbon you're getting from the increased net primary productivity of the crops that were grown in that site was not capable of replacing an extra four or five tons of manure in, manure carbon, that you were bringing in every year. Um, so, headlines like the one on the right, the myth of nitrogen fertilizer for soil carbon sequestration. Well, that really wound up our friends at Rothamsted. Um, and I did speak to Dave Paulson about this a little while ago, um, when I was umming and ahhing about whether or not to include things like this in some of my talks. Those are David's words. We propose the conclusion um, of inorganic N fertilizer causing decline in organic nitrogen concentration is false and not supported by the data from the Moro plots from numerous, or from numerous studies worldwide. Their contention that depletion of soil N by inorganic fertilizers causes a global dilemma for cereal production is equally false. Fairly strong words to have in a scientific paper, peer reviewed. And um, yeah, I mean, Dave Paulson, the late Dave Jenkinson, Keith Goulding, they're giants of modern agricultural soil science. That wasn't done lightly, and I wholly agree with them. But of course, we could go on, Darren. How have they missed it, Mark, in terms of, in terms of I reporting? I do not know. One thing I will say. If they're measuring in only, then they're only yeah. measuring in. I, one thing I really don't know. Um, one thing I will say, the journals these are published in, they're good environmental science journals. They're not agronomy journals, they're not soil science journals. It's been through peer review, but it probably has gone to two reviewers who are very competent in their field, but wouldn't understand the system's context of this. And, there are, and if I were asked to review a general environmental science paper, I could probably do a reasonable job, but there is a chance I might miss something. It's disappointing. It's disappointing that they weren't retracted, but at least this was allowed to be published to at least try and correct the record. And look, use of, clearly there are, there are downsides to using mineral fertilizer. Um, it's got a 1% of the global greenhouse gas emission comes from its production alone, never mind nitrous oxide from it. 
It's something that needs to be handled carefully. But it's not responsible for that. Because here's data from Rothamsted. Um, this is from Broadbalk, I believe. Long-term control, no additional inputs. So organic matter stays more or less the same. Adding manure. We get to a new equilibrium up here. That's a source of current discussion in the literature as to whether or not there is actually a, an upper limit. Um, I suggest some of those people could do to look at some of these data too. Um, but you stop, you stop applying manure and look what happens. It goes backwards. They didn't apply mineral in then. It wasn't. <laughs> Harbour and Bosch weren't kicking around in the 1870s. <laughs> well, they were, but they weren't working out how to make explosives and thus eventually fertilizer. Very similar. Stop bringing in more carbon than the system's capable of fixing itself, you'll slide backwards. And importantly, slide backwards almost as quick or even quicker than you went upwards in the first place. And this is where the microbes come in. This is a space of evolving understanding. There's a current before in the literature between two groups of scientists about just how important this aspect is relative to the amount of carbon coming in to start with. Um, that's currently at the stage of not quite as strongly worded letters as David's, but <laughs> one currently in review going the other way that's in preprint at the moment. Um, but as I said, most organic carbon isn't stable. It's stabilized by what? Well, it's the microbes. Um, David Jenkinson's old idea that all carbon um, passes through the microbial eye of the needle. There's plenty of evidence these days to show that a chunk of it at least doesn't necessarily have to to be stabilized, but nonetheless, it emphasizes the point that microbes are key both to the loss and the stabilization of this stuff. The term we use for this, carbon use efficiency, is literally the amount of carbon that goes in, that's the ratio of loss of CO2 versus into biomass and eventually organic matter. And each time a microbe gets hold of some carbon, that happens to it because the microbe has to respire. Some CO2 comes out of it. So you need to keep building in fresh inputs. That's one of the reasons why long fallows are not a great idea for building carbon. Because you turn off the tap, the only thing that it's got in here, it's not plant input anymore. Plant input gets replaced with soil organic carbon as your input, and you still lose some of it as CO2. Um, so ultimately, is it CUE or MPP that's the ultimate primary driver. My bet's still on MPP. There is a discussion that CUE is probably more important than giving it credit for. I don't think it can out, I don't think any amount of improving this would offset the fact that you're putting less in to start with. Um, but it's safe to say that both are important. In context of talking to growers, what do you do about this? Well, telling you to grow more plants, that's, that's something you can consider. How do you manage what microbes, how efficient your microbes are? Well, that's a much more difficult game. Colin's touched on it a bit. Lynn certainly has talked about it. Um, generally, it's going to be by trying to understand what your management might be doing to the life below. So that's what it is, what it does, where it comes from and where it goes. Um, how are we monitoring it? So I'm going to take a step back in time. Um, the National Soil Carbon Research Programme, or fondly known as SCARP. Let's send a few people into um, jitters occasionally. Certainly does in our lab when we think how many samples came through it in those three crazy years. Um, its objectives, um, often misunderstood, so I'll state them again. Apply consistent methodology to quantify carbon across Australian landscapes. Assess mid-infrared as a rapid and cost-effective means for quantifying soil carbon stocks and composition. Well, we did that. Um, quantify inputs of carbon under perennial pasture systems. That was another side project that worked pretty well. And test automated devices for measuring bulk density. Yeah, I don't think that got quite the same impact at the end as the rest of it. And there was a monstrous amount of collaborators. Um, I think the project, it's about $25 million all up when you count in kinds. And must have had nearly 30 or 40 individuals on it. That was the first time this had ever been done in Australia as well. And this was happening as I came to Australia. So I actually had no role in SCARP itself. I sort of got to watch it from the sidelines and <laughs> try and hide from it at times. 
but it was an impressive bit of work. Um, 17,000 samples analysed. I think that's actually ended up being nearer 23,000 samples at the end. Um, 4,500 sites, most of them from farm products, so it's telling us an awful lot about agricultural environments, very little about natural environments. Nothing about rangelands, and apart from where Diane Allen from Queensland Government went on a holidays in, I mean, it's quite a holidays, but nonetheless, one excursion into the territory, nothing up there either, and for that matter, not that geographically it's a huge place, there's nothing in the t ACT either. Um, South Australia is pretty sparsely done by, sadly. Um, other states, much more broadly covered. It is what it is. So that is the baseline measurement of soil carbon in agricultural lands in the country, and it was 12 years ago. I've done a bit of playing around with the data. Um, all on the big map, triangles are pasture, circles are mixed or cropping systems. Darkness is... Darkness and size are stock. You've got some big ones down in the southwest of WA. Actually, the highest stock of all was in WA, believe it or not. A dairy, um, irrigated dairy system, nearly 16% carbon on a sandy soil. It's just hydroponics, basically. <laughs> um, obviously, much smaller amounts out in the rangelands. And Pretty predictable, but long tails to them. Um, variation on the basis of soil type as well. And clearly, pasture systems would contain more than cropping and mixed systems. So that's at the national level. It's also from 12 years ago. Drilling in a little closer to um, regional level it's in um, New South Wales. We can drill down, because we've got that level of data, we can drill down to these sub-regional areas too. No surprise, what's driving the differences there? Rainfall. But relative differences are great. We actually need to understand temporal differences, and that's why we need time points. So we've been fortunate enough to be funded by DQ, Department of Climate Change, energy, environment and water, in some order. Those, they're all in there. Um, to do this thing called SOCOM, which is a revisiting of some of the SCARP sites. This is just a flyer that we produced at the source of the project, so we can wave it around and occasionally say we're doing something. Um, basically to get people back into the idea that given the hoo-ha around SCARP and that pretty much anybody who worked in soils and agriculture knew about it, but a lot of people have moved on in 12 years, trying to get people back into understanding. Unfortunately, we don't have the money to go and sample 4,000 sites again, and as the person who's got to manage the lab this time myself, I'm quite glad we don't, because <laughs> I suspect my hair would be both grey and absent by now. We've got money to sample 300 sites and to do them very, very well, and to basically build a an absolute benchmark set of data and soil samples in the National Archive so that others, third parties, universities, private companies can try and build a means to estimate soil carbon stocks and vulnerability and various other things about those soil samples far more cost effectively. All these on the right hand side, these are 18 different variables that we fed in, or I say we, Sonami, um, who co-leads the project with me fed into a um, computer algorithm that he worked with colleagues to develop to try and find the best way to get the best 300 that m are most representative of those 4,000 original sites. <coughs> yeah, go on. There we are. Yeah. yeah. That's the Mallee areas, low rainfall areas. Yep. Are we going to get any, any or get a carbon into the soil? Or are we going to virtually use it, put it in and use it up every year? You've got two issues in the Mallee. One is the rainfall. The other, of course, is the soil itself. And 
stabilizing carbon in a mostly sandy soil is a fairly difficult gig, it is always going to be a boom and bust scenario. In the Mali, it doesn't mean there aren't things that can be done to Im both improve the level of the boom and soften the lag in the bust. But each of these environments and soil types has got a fairly tight upper limit as to just how much is feasible, unless like that WA site I mentioned, which is a bizarre outlier, unless you can turn on the water at will and keep it coming, so it doesn't matter how big the hole at the bottom of the bath is, the water's pouring in at the top, unless you can manage that, which obviously isn't feasible in the vast majority of the Mali, yeah, 1% might be, <laughs> might be good. It's a tough, it's a really tough gig, but then at the same time, we talk a lot about carbon in this country because we've got this idea that a lot of it has gone back from clearing and that it was much higher under natural systems. In other cases, that's not the case. The landscape board's benchmarking study that they did in the hills showed in a lot of cases, the pasture systems had more carbon than the neighboring bush. Why? Nutrients to start with. But in the Mali, remnant Mali soils really don't have much carbon in either. And they've got perennial species growing in. Yeah. Capacity. Yes. Then you're going to have uh, tolerance and everything else. Yeah, and that comes to that resilience, that American resilience study so that I pointed to. Treat the same as people that are on 600 rainfall. No, not at all. And that message is not getting back to camp. In the context. Sorry? Sorry, I just didn't catch the context of the last bit, the message back to Canberra. One of the things we're trying to do is not only the carbon in the soil, it's overall soil health and also drought resistance, all yep. sorts of things. Under the current things that SIRTA and others measure, the wet areas are getting treated better than the dry areas. But if you added up all the mapping across the bottom of Australia, it's a big hunt. It is. It's it's I should emphasise why South Australian Mali isn't, wasn't covered in SCARP. In actual fact, like I say, SCARP was put together before I started at CSIRO. As I understand it, SCARP was initially several different projects led by several different organisations. This lot. CSIRO was asked to pull it all together into a, and run it as a national programme. At which point it became clear But these weren't here either. There was no South Australian component in the original sort of pre-SCARP system. So with a very tight budget, what was, and that became Lynn McDonald's project in SCARP. A very pragmatic approach was taken, right, what is the soil type slash land use least covered by the rest of the country that we can be consistent on with an absolute whiff and an oil rag budget relative to some of the other states? and they just targeted one soil type, um, the red brown earths. That's why the South Australian Mali doesn't have coverage, but you'll see, of course, that the Vic Mali is covered. I know it's not quite the same environment. I know there's gradients along the Mali. That, as I understand it, is the rationale that was taken 13, 14 years ago as to why South Australia is the poor partner here. Because our task in Sockham, the current project, was to resample sites, can't resample a site that wasn't there to start with. Trust me, we're having these conversations. <laughs> but if the project is to resample ones that were already taken, it's a little hard to go somewhere new. Um, it's not ideal, and obviously I'm an adopted South Australian these days. And it irks me too. Equally, we've got some really high carbon and very vulnerable soils down here that aren't covered. Um, it is what it is. Um, where were we? So relative changes. So we were basically, so if you see the blues of these, sorry, I should mention as well the detailedness on the science thing. Again, something else we wish SCARP had done more of in retrospect. Most of those 4,000 sites, we have the 25 by 25 meter grid, 
10 holes within them, three depths. You end up with three sole samples because each of the 10 samples at depth increment got homogenized. So it's describing the site, but you've got no idea of the variability. That's only 180-ish of those 4,000 or so sites. They were kept separate. They were called detailed sites. We have 10 numbers for each depth, which allows us to understand the variability within that 25 by 25 meter plot. Understanding of the spatial variability is very important if you want to understand whether or not time point one is actually higher or lower than time point two. So we've had a big focus on having as many of the, stand of the detailed sites as we can get back to in Sockham, and that's guided some of the site selection processes too. We've now pretty much hit the limit of how many we can resample and gain, gain either, either get in contact with the landholder or gain permission from them to resample. Um, but that's what the two different sets of bars in each of these things are. Um, the blue is, the dark blue are the detailed scarp sites, um, the dark green are the detailed proposed sites for Sockham, White blue is the standard sites, light green is standard sites in Sockham. In most cases, our algorithm has basically found, basically done a very good separate, um, picking out of the odd one here and there that best represents that distribution of each of these many different landscape variables. So this is the number of sites that we have within each of the states and types of sites overall. That was SCARP originally. And I think we've done a reasonable job because we didn't mention state, you know, the, the algorithm knows nothing about state boundaries. It knows the lats and the longs and the altitude, but it's not explicitly told anything else. And yet more or less, despite, so we're sampling 7.4% of, of the SCARP sites and plus or minus one or two percent. That's what it's worked out at for each of the states, state jurisdictions. So that plus all that, plus the clouds over there, which are much clearer when you look at them one at a time on a computer screen and pouring at them, but they're there for effect. That shows that we've done a pretty good job of identifying 300 sites that really do a good job of representing those 4,000. Um, what are we measuring? And I'm aware that I'm running out of time, so I will shut up soon, I promise. Um, carbon and nitrogen stocks, not surprisingly. Importantly, thanks to the work done in SCARP, Fractions we're doing by mid-infrared. We're actually doing a lot of work to build the fractions library. And there'll be benchmark fractions data available in the data that comes out of this project at the end as well. Um, because fractions turn what is a fairly pointless figure of six different sources, six different carbon concentrations into knowing a little bit about them, whether or not it's particulate, humus, or resistant. Those two, um, sorry, those two soils will behave quite differently because they have different amounts of those different soil types. Doing gravel and bulk density too, we're actually going to be measuring carbon associated with gravel. There have been a couple of papers recently showing that the bit you sieve out of the soil isn't completely free of carbon. And again, if we're looking for one or two percent changes over a number of years, a little bit more or less stuck to the gravel that you sieved out on your two mil sieve, Plus, in soils with ironstone gravel, um, that's really reactive stuff. That's probably stabilizing a fair bit directly as well as it just being an analytical artifact. So we will have an answer to that. It's something that's come up. We'd rather it hadn't because it would have made our lives easier. <laughs> but as the question's been asked, we have the perfect set of samples to answer it. So we're going to do so. Other things we're going to do as well, uh, pH and electrical conductivity, some fairly basic soil measurements on top of it, which we're never doing SCARP. SCARP, you just had organic carbon, nitrogen, the predicted fractions. Um, major and minor elements by XRF, so there'll be, in some cases, more estimate than a true value, but nonetheless, a whole load of extra ancillary <coughs> information about these soils that doesn't exist already from SCARP. Particle size analysis, so particularly we can look at clay to organic matter ratios and look at levels of saturation. And this thing that's in vogue in America and other places, it's a wonderful soil health indicator, that one the active soil carbon, the permanganate oxidizable carbon. I actually did that in a cover crops project, which is what that um, Twitter grab is from, and 
didn't find it as informative as, as I was hoping. But again, we've got 3,600 samples that we'll have all these other measures of carbon on. We might as well have one that a lot of other, organ, other, other countries and indeed organizations are measuring. So we have that benchmark data together. Um, we're also, and this is where getting permission to access sites or at least grow our involvement has become more tricky. We really need to understand what might have influenced changes over time. And that doesn't just require permission to get on landholders site or the permission to be able to share the data with geographic location, which was always a sticking point with SCARP because that question came after sampling rather than before sampling. Um, we need to spend time filling these things out with the growers. They are detailed and complex, but it's what we need to be able to understand the fine-grained detail. As we know, the devil is in the detail with auto management um, practices and how they influence soil carbon. Management type, input, species and crop, biomass production, which is all getting us towards actually under, getting a better estimate of the understanding of carbon inputs into the system and what's happened in the 12 years since they were last sampled. It's the beauty of working on commercial farms, we're actually getting real places where it happened rather than a university or research station, university research station. The downside is what happens in real life is incredibly complicated and getting a real number on it is damnably difficult. So you've got the paddock data sheet data, um, which we know is going to be incomplete. Um, sadly, it will be missing in some cases, um, as we're finding out. So we end up in what we expected to be called the data poor scenario. Thankfully, since SCARP, a lot of things have moved on in terms of the sort of data flows that are available. High resolution, both spatial and temporal, and DVI data from remote sensing. Climate data, of course, we always had that, but the spatial interpolation, interpolation is, again, improved. And we're working really hard with, that, with people from APSIM to effectively, we can't work out, if we don't know what grew, or at least how much of it grew, and what was fed to it, etc. We'll have a better than, we'll have a very good go at having a, trying to find out by growing it inside a computer instead, feeding it all the information we can. Doesn't necessarily mean it will be perfect, but it's a darn sight better than saying, oh, well, they normally get two tons over there, which is all we're left with without these tools. And all that data is going to be pulled together. So the data, sorry, the samples will be in the National Soil Archive at the end of this and through their access protocols available to anybody who wanted to do further research on them. The data will all be publicly available, um, as will be the reports. So no, none of the problems that Lynn highlighted earlier of um, research being locked away behind a paywall. The reason for this is ultimately the federal government didn't fund us to do this for the sake of it. The monitoring over time is important, but a major part of what they want out of this is a benchmark set of data and samples that other third parties can use to develop tools to try and do some of this a little more cost effectively. As we touched on, the project itself, you know, it's, it's now well within the conversation of the project to be looking at what next for sampling. Part of that discussion is most certainly a third sampling point because really you need five or six before you can be absolutely certain you're on a trajectory. The other is to cover off on geographically poor areas, which will almost certainly include parts of South Australia, if we get the go ahead. It's a long conversation, but it is one we're having. So in conclusion, soil organic matter is limited primarily by plant inputs and moderated by microbial decomposition. I think I'm happy to settle for that. I'll let the literature take its course before I change my tune. It isn't just carbon. It requires nutrients and supplies them too. But if it's supplying them, you're also losing it. So increasing net primary productivity is key. We can do that through a number of ways. And we are actually part of an exciting stage of monitoring some of these changes and trying to link that back to the management that's being done. So with that, I'll thank you for your time and thank Michael for the invitation. <laughs>